Well, this morning we'll be joined, uh, I'm joined live by Professor Matilu Mwau, the Deputy Director for the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Prof, thank you very much for, for finding time to join me this morning. And uh, in regards to that, uh, the COVID-19, there was a call by the World Health Organization, WHO, um, to all countries to, and I quote, test, test, and test uh, as part of this strategy to contain this coronavirus. Now, what is the Kenya Medical uh, Research Institute doing in regards to this call? Thank you. First of all, when we had that call from the WHO, we thought they were addressing the Kenya Medical Research Institute oh. <laughs> because we are the one, we are the one public institution that has got the capacity to test thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people and the human resources that we have and also the technical skills. So uh, our, our position is that uh, at this moment we are well placed so that if the habit call for testing of more people than we'll be right now, we are and we are going to deliver on the but we are not the only institution that has resources. Remember that the government has a testament molecular testing control of ten that have the capability of uh, the numbers of and and some other almost 200 labs in the counties that have uh, been uh, testing for tuberculosis and HIV and are well placed. So in other words, all uh, over the country that are for coronavirus testing at the moment. All right. And uh, in regards to that, um, how far are we? You've said you, you, you have the facilities, you have the machines. How far are we when it comes to you know, getting, getting the possible solutions? Thank you. Uh, you recall at the very beginning, uh, yes. around very much to just recently. Are you all right, we have lost uh, the prof there. That is Professor Matilu Mwau, the Deputy Director for the Kenya Medical Research Institute. We'll be linking up with him in a bit. Provided with samples, they are receiving fewer samples than they were capable of testing. And the major problem was just the reagents, the test reagents that were difficult to obtain because the rest of the world had ring fenced these reagents for themselves. But uh, about three days ago, large testing labs those that have automated testing uh, infrastructure into play. And even as we speak, most of the samples that are being collected right now are being tested by the automated laboratories. The automation helps with regards to protecting the health worker from getting infected because uh, when you have automated, you manipulate the sample very little. Whereas when you are doing manual testing, you manipulate the sample a lot. And that manipulation or handling with your hands is what makes you put you at risk of infection. Yeah, and uh, even as you talk about manipulation, because it can, you know, put you at risk of getting an infection. How, how yeah, are you protecting yeah. yourselves, you know, because you're the ones who are, uh, you know, handling all these things, all these samples. How, how do you protect yourselves? First of all, uh, I, in fact, I quite often encourage people to come to our laboratories and see that we look like how the men who went to the moon looked like those days in 1969. <laughs> it's very difficult for anything yeah. to touch my skin. Because uh, uh, whereas the people out there are at uh, some risk of getting infected, the people in the lab are at a much higher risk because they are handling the real live viruses. Okay? Mm -hmm. So they must dress up in what we call PPE, and they must keep the surfaces, every surface, very, very clean, decontaminated every day several times. So if you come to our labs, you'll find that we have the, uh, the reagents decontaminating the surfaces. Some of the reagents you are familiar with, like GIC and ethanol, some of them you are not familiar with, like some other things called RNAs away and so on. Those ones you may not know. Mm -hmm. But we keep our labs spotlessly clean and decontaminated. Is it, is it true that the virus has mutated, the coronavirus, that it has mutated? It's not how it was before in this initial state. Yeah, but not in the sense that you think. When you think of mutation, you normally think of, oh, now the virus drugs will not work against it or it will become much more aggressive and so on. Mm. But in, our, in, our, in science, mutation is just a little bit of changes here and there. The changes are, are helpful to the virus and some of them are even harmful to the virus itself. So there are a few changes here and there the virus goes through because 
remember that you are passaging the virus from one person, you passage it through one person, then you passage it to the next person. And the body of a person uh, puts the virus under selective pressure. The immunity puts the virus under selective pressure. So the, it's a virus's job. It is job to try to escape from that pressure mm -hmm. so that it doesn't get killed or destroyed. And the, in that sense, it changes a little bit. But the, so far, I've not seen mutations that would make me panic or worry too much. The way you see in HIV, in HIV, when there are mutations, some of them make you worry because maybe the drugs won't work. So that's mm -hmm. not what we are looking at here. Mm -hmm. So it is possible that the mutation can also work for, for good, especially for, uh, as research, uh, researchers. Yes, uh, sometimes mutations make the virus not fit to survive, okay? Mm -hmm. So, and then now it's easier for it to just uh, go away or get uh, overcome by the immune system. But some mutations make the virus fitter. But because remember, mutations are random things, all right? Mm -hmm. But for coronavirus, what we are worried about right now is not so much the mutations. This is early days. We've had it for how many days? Maybe 120 days or something. So... What we are worried about is his infectious nature. It's a very infectious virus. And this is why you are told, stay at home, wear a mask, wash your hands. Don't touch people and don't even greet people because we know how infectious it is. Don't spit around randomly. Don't sneeze randomly, you see, because we know how infectious it is. But initially, Kenya had no capacity to test any suspected case of COVID-19. In the initial stages, and we had to, you know, um, all samples had to be flown to, to South Africa, which at some point was inconveniencing uh, it, it, uh, at one level or the other. But now, Camry was recognized by WHO. You came up with the test kits. But now, let's talk about sampling, because that is where um, it all begins. Camry is leading in sampling COVID-19 cases. Speaking of sampling, how do you come up with all these samples and isolate them in the laboratory? What is the process? All right. First of all, let me make a correction. Yes. Uh, the statement that all samples are sent to South Africa is false. There's uh -huh. no such thing. <laughs> that statement is false. There were not they, no, no samples taken to South Africa. There was, if I remember correctly, there was only one sample that was taken to South Africa. Only one sample. And even that one was not tested there. We ended up testing it. Okay? Okay. So that's, that statement needs to be corrected so that Kenyans can understand just mm. what they are capable of. That's what's going Kenyans on around, so, uh, you know, in uh, even our, our, our media outlets. Yeah. But because I am now testing uh, fraternity, mm -hmm. I can tell you that Kenyans need to be aware of how much they have invested in this kind of infrastructure. Okay. So it would be a disappointment if they knew that they have invested billions of shillings and then they couldn't do a simple test like this one. The truth of the matter is that Kenyans invested in the right thing. And that's why we are able to test. This is their property. Now, coming back to sampling, mm -hmm. let me tell you what happens. So there is a person who is in quarantine or is in isolation or is admitted in hospital. Okay? This person is suspected to have coronavirus. And the... Uh, a medical worker comes to that person. The medical worker is dressed up in a protective gear, all right? And he's carrying, the medical worker, he or she, is carrying something that looks like a cotton bud, the one that you put, although you're not supposed to put it in there. <laughs> a cotton bud. Mm. Two of them that look like cotton buds. They are called swabs, okay? Now, the medical worker also has a small tube that has a liquid inside. Uh, the liquid... Is a, it just goes up to just be halfway in the tube, and uh, that liquid is called a virus transport medium. Sometimes that liquid is called a universal transport medium, UTM or VTM. So the health worker uh, puts that swab that looks like a cotton bud in the nose of the patient and pushes it all the way to the back of the nose where there's some resistance, it can't go further, and then rotates it a little bit and pulls it out and breaks the tip off and puts in the tube. Then they put the second swab inside the throat up to the back of the throat, the pharynx. And then they take it out, and then they ensure it's not contaminated with saliva, take it out, and then they put it in the, in the tube, and they close the tube. Then they put the tube in a box that has ice, okay, an ice box, a cooler box. And then they quickly bring to the lab. And if the lab is far away, they take a vehicle. But if it's near like Mbagati, they might just walk across and bring them tubes okay mm -hmm. then 
when the tubes come to us, what do we do? We look mm -hmm. at the tube. If we are doing manual testing, we add some buffer inside, some liquid inside first. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll explain to you why we do that. If we are using doing automated testing, we still add some buffer inside. Okay, some liquid. All right. But uh, in both cases, we work about safety cabinet. In other, in other words, our hands are inside something that looks like a box. And the air inside that box does not come into contact with us. It is sucked up by some suction system. So we don't get infected, right? So liquid that we add inside that tube, what does it do? So the first liquid that is called a virus transport medium. That one is to keep the virus viable until it gets the lab so that we are able to find it if it's there. The second liquid is to help us extract the genetic material from the virus. Now, imagine if the virus was like an egg. Mm -hmm. So inside the egg, in the middle of the egg is what you call, the, I think, the egg yolk. The middle is called the yolk. Yes, right? yes. So the liquid we are putting in is to break the shell and to, to, to digest the, the other protein so that we can get to the middle of the virus where the genetic material is. And that genetic material is called RNA, all right? Mm -hmm. Now, after we put the buffer to, to digest the debris, the, the irrelevant stuff, the, we purify the genetic material. If you are doing it manually, we use centrifuges and ethanol and we have a number of processes, okay? If it is automated, the machine does all this for us. In other words, when we put just one buffer in the tube, we put it in the machine and it does the rest of the extraction. When it's manual, we do a number of steps in extraction. So we end up with the RNA, if it is there, the genetic material, and then we put that through a machine called a polymerase chain reaction machine or a thermocycler, okay? In the automated systems, the thermocyclers are big in size, but in the manual system, they are small things the size of a laptop, okay? And what the thermocycler does is this. Remember, uh, maybe when we put the swab inside a person's throat, maybe we took out only 30 viruses, very small number, very, very small until you can easily detect them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is we want to amplify that genetic material so that we have enough amount for us to see it. And if we are using a real-time thermocycler, we'll see as the amplification continues whether the amount of material is... There is a graph that will be climbing as the material is increasing. So uh, what happens is that uh, when we put in the thermocycler, we also put some reagents. Now, sometimes you hear people saying Jack Ma reagents. Yes. Or you hear them saying WHO reagents or Africa CDC reagents. Those ones are a mixture of salts, some other uh, building blocks for genetic material, which we call bases, some primers and probes and some buffers that uh, make sure the pH is reasonable for the experiment to go on. But what the Jack Ma and the WHO reagents lacked was the extraction component, all right? Uh, the first part of digesting the debris from the virus that you are left, the genetic material, those reagents did not come with that extraction component. The extraction reagents did not come. But anyway, those ones at least we had from other sources. So the polymerase chain reaction uses this system plus enzymes to increase the amount or to amplify the amount of genetic material until we can see it. So if we see it, then we say you are positive. If we don't see it after many cycles of amplification, then we say you are negative. And this is the result we give to the patient. You are positive or you are negative. Now, how do we do the results? Mm -hmm. uh, if you are doing the manual testing, uh, you read as the computer uh, gives you results, you write them on a piece of paper, and then you check that everything is okay, and then you provide the results. If it's an automated system, the machine is connected to an information management system, and that system generates the results and generates your report forms and my job as a laboratory person is just to check the report form and sign and say I accept that this is the finding from the machine. So this is what has been happening. Oh, so, so that is the whole process of sampling and you know go, going through testing. And uh, it's, 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 it's quite interesting that you mentioned 30 viruses, you know, meaning that you mm -hmm. can be able to, uh, for COVID-19, you can be able to count how many viruses someone has in their system. Actually, we can do that in the sense that uh, the machine is able to detect a very small number of viruses in your, uh, in your sample, in the sample. Very, very small number, like 20, 30, 100,000. Uh, viruses are very few in real life. They're very, very few, and the machine. So in other words, if you're infected, 
the probability that you'll find out that you're infected is almost 100 percent if you're infected uh -huh, okay? uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. and uh so you, you talked about the process of testing you talked about ma manual system and the automated system yes. um in most cases how is it is it mostly manual mostly automatic when do you change from one system to the other uh, now uh, this is a market driven sort of business as people are research scientists okay first and foremost and then uh, sometimes there are specific needs from the community from kenyan co population that make us require to change our tact when we are doing our own experiment maybe just five hours i just i just to use a manual testing system because it's like it's like you want to move from one home to another and then you take the SGR with all the cabins for you to put your property and just have a few beds. Does it mm -hmm. make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. You just take a car or pick up. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing. So when we are just doing a few tests here and there, all we want to do is to do a few tests and therefore use a manual system. But there are some uh, uh, assignments we've been given by government that have required that us guys use the automated system. For instance, remember we've been testing for HIV in terms of providing viral loads. And remember that up to 1.4 million or more Kenyans are infected, maybe 1.6 million. So if we want to do 1.6 million tests in one year or double that number, we have to use automated systems. And that's why we've invested in automated systems. And uh, as, it, as you invest in the automated systems, I remember that uh, um, you were having an interview with one of uh, our colleagues here in KBC, and uh, you had talked about, um, you know, how the, you, you have so many, you have the machinery that can be able yeah, to yeah. do all this work. And uh, yeah. uh, in, in Cambridge Labs, you have high-tech digital PCR uh, machines. And uh, you say that your machines can answer a lot of questions. But now, um, how many yeah. uh, questions have you been able to get answers to through your own machines? Uh, because you talked about how long you, your machines can answer questions like how long the virus has been in human beings, whether it, is, yeah. whether, whether yeah. it has been longer in Kenya more than the way it, was, it has been recorded in March. Uh, so have you been able to acquire possible solutions towards um, curbing the COVID-19 through getting the, the answers from these machines? Uh, first of all, there are some things we've been asking myself, uh, ourselves sorry, that uh, we want answers to, even if we, the answers will make us feel good. But also as scientists, we want answers because it's interesting to do this kind of research <laughs> and provide solutions, all right? <laughs> For instance, we were told that uh, the first person with coronavirus came into Kenya around yes. 2nd right, yeah. of March. Okay. This could be true. But as scientists, we usually go into, into a discussion with clean hands that uh, we may, in the course of our research work, discover that the person came into Kenya maybe on 5th March and not 2nd, for instance, mm -hmm. or came in February, for instance. So as a scientist, you must be open to finding out things. But... There are some questions that are of interest to us that we are starting to work on now. And as, a, as scientists, we, we start that work by writing the research proposals. So they are reviewed by our peers so that the science is sound and the ethics are sound. And then we can do the work. We haven't gotten the proposals. Uh, the, the, the peer review of those propos proposals has not been completed yet. Mm -hmm. But in any case, our initial assignment right now is to provide the testing capacity. Once we are settled with the testing capacity, this is what we are going to do. We are going to do the science, maybe from like, from uh, maybe end of this month or from next month. Mm -hmm. And the things we'll be looking at will be, are people shedding virus after they have been discharged and been declared in? Are they still continuing to contaminate the environment and therefore posing a risk? Mm -hmm. We want to know that because that's a question out there in the international community, okay? Mm -hmm. The second question you want to ask is, is in Kenya, how does this virus look like? Does it look like the one, genetically speaking, <laughs> like, the, like the one in the China or the one in the Europe and so on? Mm -hmm. uh, if we want to make vaccines, if they make them fast in Europe or in the United States, will those vaccines work here? They will only work here if the virus here looks like their virus. It doesn't look like their virus here. We want to know. If we are looking at uh, 
making drugs for this virus. Some of the drugs are based on how a virus looks like, okay? So if we want to make tests, like rapid tests for this virus, we must know how exactly it looks like. So we must check and uh, using our sequencing machines and other things. Uh, there is a possibility that we'll go to blood samples that we collected in the past mm -hmm. if we get permission. Okay. Past means like two years down the line, five years down the line, 10 years down the line, and we check whether they had this virus. If we discover that they had, then the whole story about how this one came from China and so on and so forth might even change. And then you'll even feel guilty that you are claiming, <laughs> oh, did he? But if we find that they didn't have any virus, then you will say, ah, so it's actually possible that this virus came from, you know, the East and came this way. So far and then we'll also look at it. Hmm? So, so far from your, your research, from your findings, have you been able yeah. to establish that maybe the virus has been there longer than what we have been, you know, talking about. First of all, from our, this is not research we have done because it's too early for us. It's too early. But people have already done this kind of work in other places. And this is what the thinking is. The current thinking in science, from the evidence that has been collected by scientists, is that the virus entered into humans from animals. Uh, it seems to have come from bats and the bats are specific to a certain cave in the Hubei province where the Wuhan city is the capital. And uh, those bats did not infect humans directly. It seems that they infected pangolins. Okay? Mm -hmm. And when they infected pangolins, uh, when we look at the virus in pangolins, it looks almost the same as the one in humans, but with a kidogo difference. And that difference is what is that making us ask ourselves, was there another animal in between? Okay. And it's possible there was another animal in between. All right. Uh, so we'll be looking up with him. Uh, we, we just let him just n n some network interruptions. Uh, he is explaining, you know, that process of um, that whole process of how uh, you know researchers are coming up with ideas and solutions towards you know curbing the COVID nineteen. Has it been there longer than we think? Has it been there for years? And it has just been discovered. Well, that is uh, uh, Professor Matilu Mwau, the deputy director for the Kenya Medical Research institute giving us his take from Camry. He says that they have the machines, they have the ability to do the testing, they have the ability to do the sampling, and they're still working on getting more uh, tests being done on Kenyans. So Professor Macau, uh, thank, th thank you very much for you know um, giving us your take on that. Uh, as we continue with this conversation, you are, you're telling us that, that yes. it is possible that there was another animal in between here. Just finish, finish up that before we yes. continue on to yes. the next thing. So mm. it is possible that there was an animal between pangolins and humans. Okay. Uh, and that animal, we will find it if it, is there. If, if it was there. We will find it. But there is some evidence that this particular coronavirus was in West Africa in humans as early as 1830. Okay. 1830. Not 1930, 1830. So... Uh, this is research other people are doing, but uh, our time is coming uh, because this virus came to us much later than to other countries. And uh, we will have our findings and then we will share as an international community. Um, based on your findings, have you been able to discover uh, cases of uh, how the virus spreads? For example, we have cases of people who have succumbed to because of the virus, 40 cases of deaths here in Kenya. Based on your in findings, Kenya, have you been able to nine. determine whether it can come or be spread from the dead to the living? Ah, okay. We haven't, but I can tell you what others have found uh, and the guidelines that the WHO has provided that is based on what others have found. The most infectious viruses you can think about are like the viral hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola or Marburg. Those ones, if you touch a dead body with your finger, finished. Now, we also know that WHO classifies a pandemic flu, like those H1N1s and so on, as in that infectious bracket. Mm -hmm. Now, we are not very clear in our minds about how exactly how infectious coronavirus is in the dead bodies. Uh, we are still doing that work. But WHO, out of an abundance of caution, uh, seems to suggest that we should treat that body with the same care that we treat 
when we are looking at a person who has died from pandemic flu. And this is the reason why you are seeing uh, people are getting buried in body bags and uh, even you are not very keen to do a post-mortem so that you don't contaminate and infect other people who, are, who will be at risk even of death, right? But I want to remind you something, and this one is something I have to say. Remember, when HIV came into the country, mm. we had the same level of knowledge as we are having now for coronavirus. Not very much. And then so we said, oh, people who have HIV need to be buried in body bags and so on. But mm. as we accumulated the scientific evidence, we got to a point where we said, ah, you should just bury a person who died of HIV normally as you do anybody uh -huh, else. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And this is what happened. So do not be surprised if one day in the future we give you new guidelines. But these guidelines on burying coronavirus victims mm -hmm. will be based on the evidence we collect with the time. At this moment, you don't have sufficient evidence. And for that reason, you must practice an abundance of caution. All right, Professor, as we bring this discussion to a close, just briefly, um, we have a comment here by a viewer. This is uh, someone is asking, how long does the virus stay in the dead? In the dead? Yes. We do not know, but uh, we do not know but probably a very short period of time because right. this virus needs cells for it to survive. And you know when you die, your cells decompose very quickly. So maybe a very short period of time. All right. Thank you very much, Professor. That is Professor Matilu Mwao joining us live. He is the Deputy Director Thank for you. the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Thank you very much for, for finding time to uh, uh, join us this morning. Thank you very much.